Bioswell project. And I'm saying it to assess runoff reduction because we actually haven't started with the runoff reduction measurements just yet. We've just gone through the restoration project. We started it earlier this year. So it's been about eight months. And so we need to let the vegetation get mature. And then we're going to uh, start with the uh, hydrologic modeling or hydrologic measurements. So um, today I'm just going to talk about the restoration process, how we got it up to where we are right now and then a little bit about the measurements that we will be taking to assess runoff reduction. So first off, what is a bioswale? It's basically a shallow ditch that collects rainwater and then uh, conveys it towards the destination, but slows down that rainwater and kind of lets it uh, infiltrate into the soil just a little bit better. And here's just kind of a basic schematic of what that would look like. And so we asked, uh, can we turn our current backslope swales that system that we have in the flood control district, can we put native vegetation, make them a little bit more of a, a native bioswale? So uh, uh, backslope swales, as we use them in the flood control district, uh, they collect and convey uh, stormwater runoff to channels and detention basins through uh, pipes. And that minimizes the amount of runoff that flows over the slopes and that reduces the erosion that could occur. And it's necessary, as I said, for, for long-term uh, uh, integrity of these grass line channels and the tension basins. And they're essentially turf uh, grass line bioswales. So I guess you can consider them bioswales, but we want to push that a little bit further, get some uh, native vegetation in them. And so here's some uh, design criteria st stats for those swales. Uh, they're about 10 foot wide, uh, two foot max depth. They have a, a side slopes that are fairly steep of one and a half horizontal to one foot uh, vertical. There's a drain every uh, 800 feet, if, uh, every 400 feet if you're working in dispersive clays, and that drain drops the water down and directly into the channel. Um, and then the grade as well, 0.2% uh, uh, typical and 0.4% if you're working in dispersive clays. Here's a cross section of what that looks like. Uh, the, the backslope swales, these little green areas, and they run parallel to our channels in the tension basins, and it drops the water. Instead of the water going over the bank, into the channel, it drops down first and then directly into the channel that way. And this is what it looks like in the wild. Uh, grass line, backslope swale. Here's that interceptor structure which drops the water down and then into the channel. Usually there's a maintenance berm and in this case, we kind of have a pedestrian pathway. So with our bias well demonstration project, the purpose was to evaluate the effectiveness and the practicability of modifying these backslope swales and using native prairie vegetation. Uh, the impetus for that is our MS4 permit, the Municipal Separate Storm Water Sewer System. It's regulated by and uh, reported to the TCEQ, and it states that we have an obligation to incorporate low-impact development or green infrastructure facilities whenever practicable. So we're going to basically see if converting these grass line swales to a more native vegetation, if it's practical uh, in terms of reducing the runoff volume and also improving the stormwater quality. So we have two sites where we're testing this. Uh, one of the sites is located along the Braze Bayou tributary and the other one on the Langham Creek tributary. Uh, and so we tried to split it up, this up between uh, Beaumont Formation Soils, which is on the Braze uh, Bayou site. They're more simplistically to characterize them as a, a lower permeability. And then the one on the Langham Creek tributary site, uh, a little bit more moderate permeability, a little bit sandier soil in the upper portion. Um, and those are, are classified as those dispersive more erodible clays, and as I mentioned before, the, um, uh, the specifications for those backslope swales are a little bit different. So we kind of got one site in one configuration and one in the other to kind of uh, show what happens around the county. And then the two treatments that we have is just the treatment plot with our native veg prairie vegetation and a reduced maintenance regime. And the second one is our control plot with just standard turf establishment and then three annual mows, which is what all turfed areas that the uh, flood control district maintains they get mowed three times a year. So here are locations in regard to Houston and Harris County and our, and our highways. Uh, fairly close, but they are situated on those two ge ge different geologic formations. This is a little bit more up close photo. This is the Bray site. We have uh, um, our treatment plot right there and our control plot. There's the channel. Uh, there's a pedestrian pathway going right there. It's a little bit squeezed in, but we made it work. There's a park, community center, surrounded by a neighborhood, and in the middle of these plots uh, is that inlet interceptor drain that drops down and out into the channel. And the same with the Langham Creek tributary site, uh, treatment, control, there's the channel, and it's surrounded by a uh, suburban neighborhood. 
So just some study considerations. Uh, the site selection, we just wanted to be consistent as possible uh, with these. Our plot size is about 14 foot wide by 500 feet long. Uh, similar environmental conditions, you know, a suburban setting, try to get as much sunlight as possible. Uh, drainage area was pretty similar. We figured out the drainage area beforehand. Uh, we had some uh, public communication that we did before we started the project. Uh, these were areas that were maintained by either a uh, municipal utility district or an HOA. We had to meet with them first to let them know what we were doing, that we were not going to have, you know, manicured turf grass, that we were going to have, you know, uh, taller grass, taller vegetation. They were pretty receptive, um, didn't have much pushback, fortunately. And then uh, the main one, practicability and repeatability. Um, you know, if we're going to implement this on a larger scale, we can't be going in and, and making any major modifications to these sites. We still need them to function uh, the same way that they do. Um, we need to keep uh, future, any future maintenance needs uh, to a minimum. And then also, uh, you know, this is mostly to keep costs as low as possible. We couldn't, you know, go in there and add a lot of mulch or compost or, or you know, we try to keep fertilizer down because if we're going on a larger scale, that's going to make our costs go up quite a bit. So I'm going to go through really quick with uh, uh, what we did to implement um, the restoration. First off, you know, the sites were covered in turf, so we had to herbicide uh, to remove that turf and the treatment plots only. Uh, we did some seed bed prep, dissed the soil a little bit, um, made sure that our elevation was correct. We had to verify that the water was actually draining towards those inlets um, appropriately. Uh, we did some seeding. We just broadcast that seeding by hand. We put some uh, plugs in <clears throat> into the plot as well. Uh, we installed some signs uh, to exclude mowers from mowing the area and then also for some public education. Uh, we did a little bit of maintenance, uh, especially in the early days um, after installing the seed and the, and the uh, transplants. And then uh, just some monitoring to make sure that, um, you know, for that first year that those transplants and the seeds are actually doing well. So uh, this is kind of what it looked like after we herbicided. Um, we did this in mid-February 2018, right after uh, the dormancy break, when, right when things started getting green a little bit. We, we hit it with some herbicide as early as possible. We did two applications before and one application after um, the seedbed prep, after that disking, and we just used glyphosate. And uh, the main stuff we were trying to kill, the only thing that was there was Bermuda grass and uh, St. Augustine. And so then we, uh, uh, we tilled the plots very, very, you know, about four to six, no, not too deep. Um, we did that one week after that initial herbicide application. And then, as I mentioned before, we, we went in and we herbicided again because there were still those kind of nodes of, of Bermuda and St. Augustine that were greening back up again. And then we let the thatch remain as, as a thin layer atop the soil. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we were pretty, didn't have a whole lot of real estate in between here. Worked out pretty well. I think we only cut one person's cable the whole time, but um, uh, I think it may have been old. It didn't, no one complained, so I don't think it was, was doing anything. Uh, that's what the other site looked like, a lot, of, a lot more space, but they were the same size. Okay, the grading, as I mentioned, we actually did a survey out there to make sure that the grade was appropriate. Only one site needed grading, that was the control plot at the Braze site. And so what we did, this is what the grade was supposed to be, and this is what we got. And all we did was we had to move this little bit of soil into this area and that little bit of soil into that area. We didn't have to truck anything in or move anything out. It worked out really well. And uh, there was some pooling before that, and that's, that's kind of where we moved that soil in there so it drained appropriately. And then once... Can I ask a question? Yeah. Where is this water coming from? Because I see the fence. Yeah. I, it's, it's, we we kind of looked at the drainage area and where things were, were, were going in with the topographic survey and the old LIDAR that we had. And we made sure that, you know, this is draining from people's, either people's yards or just the neighborhood park or nearby. And then it, cause, because this was the control plot, we uh, reseeded it with some turf grass just to make everyone happy. So with our seeding, uh, we did about a 60-40 grass to forward mix. Uh, we focused on things that would germinate very quickly. With the grasses, we used uh, mostly NRCS cultivars that we got from uh, DK Seeds. With the forbs, um, that was mainly to try to uh, uh, get some wildflowers in for some public consideration, make it look a little pretty as well. Um, also early germination. I added in a couple species that would help with uh, nitrogen fixation and some rhizomes uh, to kind of take up a little bit of space. We seeded with 15 pounds per plot. Uh, the plots were only 0.16 acres. Typically, you're supposed to use, uh, they recommend eight pounds per acre with this mix. So we re really seeded the heck out of this thing. Um, as Jim mentioned earlier, 
one of the lowest costs for these projects are the seeds. So we said, let's just, just get a bunch of seed and just throw it out there to, to make sure we get co some good coverage. And these are, these were our seeds. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but that's just a lot of uh, NRCS cultivars, kind of like your usual sp suspects for your Forbes. But then I, I threw in uh, three ones, the Illinois bundle flower, partridge pea, and then Maximilian sun sunflower. Uh, the, the bundle flower and the partridge pea, I'd seen kind of a, um, germinate really quick and their nitrogen fixtures. Um, I was hoping they would kind of, kind of show up really early, you know, make it look nice. And then also maybe be like a little bit of a nurse crop. And then the Maximilian sunflower, um, those kind of form a little bit more of a, a rhizome and kind of take up some real estate in the plots. So their seeding, uh, in the treatment plots only, we mixed it with uh, 12 pounds of lime per plot. And the reason we did that was at the Langham Creek site, which has a little bit more dispersive soils that can help amend the soil a little bit, uh, to, to reduce that erosion. And then, um, we also added some moist sand in there too, to kind of weigh that seed down. And we just broadcast by hand. We did that immediately before transplanting. So when the guys come in and they put the transplants in there, they're stepping on that seed. They're getting that, they're, they're increasing that seed soil contact. Um, Jim mentioned he likes that culture packer. I, I thought that this would kind of recreate that cult packing. We wouldn't have to do that step. And we did this uh, early March. And as I mentioned, right after the seeding, immediately after we did the transplanting, this is a very, very conceptual design of, of what I was trying to do uh, with the different rows. So um, we had nine rows in our plots. Uh, we had an inner row, which was four foot centers, uh, a little bit more wet tolerant uh, grasses because that's at the center line of that bioswale. Uh, our middle rows, those were three foot centers, a mix of grasses and forbs. And then the outer rows, again, three foot centers, a little bit more drought tolerant. It's a little drier up on, up on the top of those swales. Uh, so for the transplanting, we had over 3,000 plants that we put in the ground that we got from either Houston Audubon or uh, Morning Star Prairie plants. And uh, this is kind of what I was hoping to get um, within for each row, but then, you know, it's just kind of what's available. So I tried to get, um, Florida pass pollen, switchgrass, Gulf cord grass, and Eastern gamma grass for that middle row. Um, I could really only get Florida pass pollen and Eastern gamma for that middle row. Uh, with the outer rows, um, tried a, a greater mix, but really ended up with a ton of muley, which was fine with me um, because it, it kind of created a, a, a barrier, like a boundary along those outer edges, um, made it look a little bit more like a garden for the neighborhood. Um, and it, it's just a pretty grass. and, and I was thinking it may kind of exclude some, some uh, species from creeping inward a little bit more. And then you guys definitely can't read that, but uh, that's for the middle row. And I kind of had it broken up into three sections, uh, less than 10% and then 15 to 30% and then 70%. And the less than 10% for these species, there's a lot, of, a lot of milkweed, coreopsis, species that really don't have a large footprint, um, kind of smaller, single species. And then species that are, have a little bit more of a greater footprint. I was just trying to get uh, species that take up a lot of space so we don't have a lot of bare ground because there's a lot of other non-native species around us in our uh, uh, suburban habitat that could creep in. So I was trying to prevent that as much as possible. So they're transplanting. We, we sort of laid out the species, the, the, the plants, the pots, and then we, uh, we put them in the ground. And that's what it looked like immediately after transplanting. We installed our signs. Uh, this is, these two were mainly to just direct the mowers to not mow in our plots. And then we also uh, developed a, a public educational signage of what we kind of hope uh, this plot will look like and what we kind of expect would happen with the, with the uh, runoff to uh, get a little bit lower into the soil column. And that's kind of what it ended up looking like. So with the maintenance, um, we haven't done any mowing yet. Um, I'm not sure when we will. We'll just kind of play that by ear, whether or not we need to mow. Um, we did some initial watering of the site immediately after uh, the transplanting a couple times because we, we put the stuff in the ground and then it just got really hot and it stopped raining. Um, so we, we needed to water a little bit. So we had a couple, couple times watering, but it's fine now. Um, and then we did some invasive hand pulling, mainly with the Bermuda grass, because even after all that herbicide, there were still some nodes that were kind of hanging out in the ground and the herbicide didn't really affect them. And then they re-sprout and they, they kind of take up space. And then also recently we had an infestation of Angleton blue stem that I didn't realize until the, until it got really, really bad. And so we pulled all that last week and this stuff is just 
terrible. I mean, this is, this is one plant right here, and it's, it could get 12 foot long. It forms a stem, and then it falls over, and it connects at each node. It was really bad, but we ended up having um, a lot of extra plants that we didn't put in the ground um, that we were able to rescue from Coulter, the Coulter Elementary uh, Prairie. And so we took a lot of plants from them, and we had them uh, just in storage, and we were able to reseed and replant the areas uh, where we pulled all this Angleton bluestem. Uh, for the monitoring, um, we did some quarterly monitoring. This was just basically to make sure that the contractor um, has a little bit of a stake in what they're doing and kind of uh, uh, um, take some responsibility over how well they put the plants in the ground and keeping them alive. Uh, so at the 90, 180, 270, and 365 day events, we, have, we go out there with them. And the idea was to do a quantitative survey and to say, okay, uh, if you have 80% survival, anything above 80% is fine, but if you have lower than 80%, um, you need to replace these transplants, and if you have a, but that's okay if you have like a set greater than 70% of the seed bank coming up with uh, native perennials from that seed mix. But it was really hard to, after a while, to figure out where one transplant stopped and the other one began because it actually started looking really great. So it just kind of turned into from a quantitative to a qualitative. So, but things are looking really good. Um, and we're at about 200 days post planting. So I'll show you kind of the time frame of what things look like. Three weeks after planting, still a lot of bare ground, but um, we started seeing a lot of uh, uh, really good uh, seedling germination. Um, there's some of you, you guys can see that. There's some kind of a, a pinnate leaves, some feathery uh, leaves happening. That's, that's either the partridge pea or the Illinois bono flower germinating really quickly. And that's a, a rosin weed um, flower actually popping up too. So that was good to see. Six weeks post planting, still a lot of bare ground, but you know, things are starting to do a little bit better uh, as Rattlesnake Master. And then this uh, um, <clears throat> swamp milkweed that's actually flowering at the time. Uh, two months, a little bit less bare space um, coming in. Some interesting stuff that's a Liatris pycnostica, and that's a, a seed head from a uh, gamma grass. And then early, early summer, uh, the Coreopsis was really doing well, and things were starting to to really kind of pop and uh, you know look really pretty. And uh, that's Illinois bundle flower right there. That species did really well at our braise site, but didn't do so well at our Langham site. But then partridge pea did really well at the Langham site and not so well at the braise site. So I'm not really sure what caused that swap, but it was just good to have both those seeds in the mix to kind of hedge our bets a little bit. That, I thought that was kind of interesting. But I'm glad I added those two in the mix because they ended up doing really well just at different sites. Um, Midsummer, kind of the flowers are going away. It doesn't look that great to the naked eye or if you don't know what you're looking for. But uh, we did have a lot of grasses start coming up. Um, you know, side oats, gamma, or grandma, uh, Texas grandma, um, some love grass coming up. Um, green, this is green sprangle top that was in the seed mix, which is something that uh, it's an early colonizer, but it's supposed to kind of go away after the first couple years. And then um, uh, some bristol grass as well. And then uh, early fall, um, Indian grass and big blue stem were coming up, uh, some latris and some other species. If you were kind of hanging out in there, you would think that this was actually a pretty decent prairie. It looks natural, except for the fact that it's a really long linear rectangle. That's not really natural, but that's, that's by design. The mowers weren't getting in there. They were mowing right along the edge. It was, it was pretty cool to see. Um, so that's kind of what's going on uh, up, up until this point. We'll keep monitoring it. Um, we're going to start that hydrologic model, uh, monitoring pretty soon. It's going to commence uh, November uh, this year, and it's rainfall dependent. Obviously, during rainfall events, uh, we have to have a minimum 0.1 inch rainfall event. It's got to have an antecedent dry period of 72 hours, which means that it can't have rained uh, three days prior, so that soil is not completely saturated, and it's got to generate runoff, of course. And then uh, we initially have it set at five years of data collection with the option to um, you know, continue if sufficient data isn't collected. Uh, we're also gonna look at rainfall at the site. Obviously, we need to know how much rainfall fell. Uh, we're also gonna look at the infiltration layer in the uppermost profile of the soil using a turf tech infiltrometer. Uh, we're gonna calculate the runoff volume, which leaves the site and the flow rate. We're gonna use a custom weir plate uh, for the treatment and the control plots. Uh, a weir plate, this is kind of what it looks, looks like. Um, it basically regulates the flow of runoff and you can determine how much uh, volume leaves 
by using this equation. Don't ask me about what any of that means. Uh, it's really confusing, but it all kind of boils down into um, this equation right here, which is the reduction in runoff volume equals the rainfall amount times the drainage amount divided by the total volume of runoff leaving the site at the inlet. And so this weir plate is, is positioned on top of that in, uh, inlet structure in the middle. When runoff flows through there, it fills up this little V notch and there'll be little notches in the side and they can time it. And then as the runoff kind of goes up uh, this little, uh, this V area, they can measure that and then use this equation to basically get um, the amount of runoff which leaves. So we'll compare what happens at the treatment plots with the native vegetation to the control plots with just the turf grass. We're also gonna look at uh, water quality. Uh, we're gonna take grab samples, which is basically just grabbing soil, or uh, grabbing water as it leaves the site, looking at E. coli, pH, um, and some, some different uh, uh, um, elements there. I don't know if that's gonna tell too much because it's not a big, we're not gonna have a lot of runoff generated from uh, roads or you know big agriculture areas, but we may may see something. Um, next steps uh, for this, obviously the data collection and the analysis. Are we going to see an immediate impact uh, from from this? Are we going to see uh, the runoff volume be dropped uh, immediately between the treatment and the control, or is it going to take some time for the vegetation to establish? Um, we're not sure. Um, we can take additional data. I would really like to go out there if I have time and look at species richness see how well things did. <clears throat> um, obviously, there's a lot of pollinators. Uh, maybe there's, you know, someone could do a pollinator study and then also public perception as well. Um, we've had a lot of, a, a, so far, good response. Um, the, the lady who's the, in charge of the Municipal Utility District, every time I'm out there, she seems to be kind of walking by and she, we always kind of talk. And she said that people have come up to her and said how much they've liked this area. And she said, and they always say, oh, I love what the mud's done here. And, and she, she basically says, oh, it's the flood control district that did it. I don't know if their opinion changes after that, but <laughs> they, seem to be, they seem to be liking it. So that, that's kind of nice. Um, and then as well, you know, after this, if we do see an impact and we do see uh, um, an improvement, can we implement this on a larger scale? Where can we do it? If we identify some uh, areas where we can install these bioswales, you know, should we be retrofitting them in areas that already exist? or can we install them immediately following areas that have been constructed? Um, you know, in the methods and design, um, could we just do seeding um, instead of the transplanting? That's where the majority of our costs came. It would be great if we could just seed only and, and um, you know, get some improvement there. Um, we still need to figure out what the annual maintenance needs are um, and then just basically work on keeping our costs as low as possible because, you know, we're up competing against turf grass, which is super cheap. You can just spread it. We know it works. So we just need to make sure that, um, yeah, we, we have, we enter it with that in mind. And um, yeah, before I take questions, I just want to acknowledge my coworkers as well in the stormwater quality department. It's, it's been a, a collaborative effort with everyone. And, and um, yeah, I'll take your questions now. Thanks.